But people who are crammed together usually have weaker immune systems. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So the researchers were, were, were saying, you got to get away from this one size fits all stuff. This is ridiculous. And what we want to do is protect the high risk elderly individuals. Because if you take, if you take all the people who've died from COVID-19, uh, 38% of them are elderly. About 20% of them have pre-existing conditions. And 20% of them have autoimmune problems. That's almost 80%. I was just asked the other day by someone new to us if I was the Forbidden Doctor. Well, of course, I said no. The Forbidden Doctor is not me at all. We are not the Forbidden Doctor. Jack is not the Forbidden Doctor. It's in you. The Forbidden Doctor is that magical, mystical power inside of you that is controlling and healing you. It's that beautiful, marvelous, almost miraculous force that controls all healing. It's that innate intelligence, that life force directed influence that triggered your dna to guide the building of your body after conception yeah it's that power that sustains your life repairs your wounds and lesions and it never stops working it's that essential part of you that keeps you alive and heals your every hurt this is the forbidden doctor it's not me it's that part of you the powers that be have decreed forbidden to ever learn about or even consider and never ever rely upon for it is forbidden that you even know this life force exists at all you are your own forbidden doctor yes hey everybody it's me dr jack and welcome back to the forbidden doctor podcast this is podcast episode 197. You just won't believe it. Yes, it's not that you won't believe the podcast. You may have trouble, but that's the name of it. You just won't believe it. Now, I'm going to be talking about some forbidden stuff that's been hidden from you for way too long these last several weeks, uh, even months, I guess. But be And Mary is with family, and she's just away, and she will be back before too long to join me in some more podcasts. But she's away... Um, with family stuff. So, but before that, you know, I want to mention again um, what keeps us on the air. That's ForbiddenDoctor.com. We've just opened to the world our 600 symptom protocols. In other words, if you have, let's say, some kind of coronavirus and you're, you know, somewhat embarrassed, you don't want to tell anyone, you don't want to be tested, and you choose not to go to a doctor because you, you know, you just think you might, have something and you're concerned you don't even want to do our free symptom survey, you can just simply search for our flu coronavirus protocol on our website. And there's some things that will strengthen the immune system listed there that we would recommend. And it's simple. You just click in the upper left search field on our website and discreetly read about and purchase the protocol if that's what you wish to do in one easy swoop. And when you join our new $29 VIP membership, you're going to get the um, flu coronavirus protocol, as well as others, for 20% off. You're not going to find lower prices for standard products anywhere. You'll also get free shipping over 100 and discreet HIPAA texting capabilities. Write to me if you wish. I'll answer your text, or Mary will, or Carrie, our nutritionist, if you prefer. You, you know, you choose. And understand, we'll text you and answer your questions quickly. During business hours, you can text us 24-7 because we have been known to answer text questions at all hours of the night and weekends. Just, you know, just say it. We don't guarantee quick uh, response after hours, but during business hours, for sure, we can get back to you a lot sooner. You would just go to ForbiddenDoctor.com uh, slash VIP on our, or on our homepage of the website. Just click the box for VIP membership to learn more. All right, I want to get started with some base, basic ideas here. I want to talk about two or three, maybe three different concepts relative to the last few months of what uh, might be missing in your understanding of what's going on out there. This, uh, this is a headline I just picked up on the Internet here the other day. Seventy scientists and economists are urging President Donald Trump to include professional statisticians 
on the White House's coronavirus task force to prevent the team's researchers from being led astray by bad COVID models, end quote. Hoo-hoo-hoo. You know, I, I've been saying this for some time. What's missing on the president's task force would be some true academics up there, especially a statistician. Because you, what, what do you have? You got all these uh, scientists and economists and medical experts all urging the president uh, right now to add professional uh, a professional statistician to his coronavirus task force team. Because the models that are coming out of the administration, mo- mainly by Dr. Fauci, are uh, relying, the, the, the models that the administration is relying upon could potentially lead his administration astray. As I've been saying in these podcasts for several weeks now, the president's getting some very bad advice. And so um, there, uh, a bunch of academics sent the president uh, a letter. I think this is what? This is uh, Saturday. It was last Tuesday. Uh, several ideas the president could use to, to boost the team's pandemic response. They believe that by adding an expert statistician to the COVID-19 task team could help Trump avoid relying on poor models that really don't reflect the real world. Now, what do I mean? Well, here's some um, supporting data reported by the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, which I think... Um, according to this uh, article, rather mathematically and scientifically, backs up the idea that there should be a statistician involved with the modeling of the spread, uh, the curve, the flattening, whatever else, uh, the terms they want to use, relative to this COVID-19. And I'm going to quote from this article here. Such an immediate addition will reduce the chances of being misled by speculative computer models and other data. So the people, end quote, and the people that signed this uh, threw in some extra articles why they think the, the models get it wrong without a statistician's help. Now, if you contacted your local life insurance policy salesperson and you were to ask them for a million dollar policy, uh, you know, the home nurse is going to come and draw blood and do a few different check, checks on you to make sure your heart's working and that, you, you know, you, you aren't comorbid or something and not, or not suffering from some comorbidity. And uh, your profile will be given to a model based on statisticians' work that this life insurance company is betting – according to the statistics, that you're going to stay alive for a long time while you pay the premiums on a million-dollar policy so that they can take that money and invest it and do things with it so that if there ever comes a time when uh, it's, you know, it can be cashed in because of death or you have universal life or you're doing something else with the numbers, the insurance company is protected by the statistician's work. Well, what these scientists are saying, what I've been saying for several weeks, is that that should be applied to this COVID-19 thing. Now, in the Daily Signal, April 23rd of the Daily Signal, retired epidemiologist James Enstrom says in, um, in a piece, he says, quote, all other COVID-19 models are grounded in important assumptions about which there is currently little knowledge. He's one of the letter's signees, and he suggests, quote, some deaths are being classified as COVID-19 deaths, even when COVID-19 is not the underlying cause. And this is what happens when you when you don't have somebody holding true to the mathematical model of what's going on. Then all this noise starts showing up and panic and more fear. Now, a couple of podcasts ago, I uh, gave you some statistics from the CDC, and uh, real quickly, just real quick review, out of the 327 million people uh, on the planet from, I mean in America, from January 1st to April 8th, uh, there were 501,000 deaths of 327 million people. Of that half a million deaths, 4,000 of those deaths were listed as COVID-19 as of... um, April 8, 4,500 were from the flu, 35,000 were from pneumonia, 1,800 of these cases 
also seem to have COVID-19. But 4,065 of the deaths were from COVID-19. 35,000, almost nine times more, were from pneumonia. And so you bring a statistician in, they start running these numbers, and what it works out to is that 0.153% of the U.S. population died from January 1st, April 4th. 0.153% of the total population. Of that total population, 0.81 were due to COVID-19. 0.89 were due to the flu. 766% more deaths have occurred from pneumonia than from COVID-19. Now, here in the state of Utah, just this morning, I think they announced two more. The, the state has, I, I think, close to 4 million people. And two more deaths this morning, listed this morning. Your chances of dying from pneumonia compared to COVID-19 is 766 times more. In other words... For every one death from COVID-19, there's 766 deaths from pneumonia. Now, statistics are always about probability. They're not about certainty. So, you know, there's a cutoff rate in there at some point. But what the bottom line of that is, this is why these scientists are calling for the president to put a statistician up there on the, on the dais along with Fauci and Burks and, and whoever else is up there, because deaths due to COVID-19 simply are not significant when you look at the numbers, meaning that this many people could have died from anything and the world at large would never have taken notice. 0.81% and 0.89% are not statistically significant, which is why we don't really notice the number of people who die every year from the flu unless it was a member of the family or, or a co-worker or something. And we would never have noticed people dying from COVID-19 if it wasn't smattered all over the television all day long. And when Fauci, <clears throat> Fauci came out in January, January of this year, and said there would be 2.2 million American deaths, well, of course everybody got scared. I got to think, 2.2 million coronavirus? I don't think so because of all the coronaviruses that come and go every flu season. We've never seen 2.2 million people die. And the chance of dying from non-complicated pneumonia, as I said earlier, is 766 times greater than the chance of dying from COVID-19. So that's why I think they ought to have a statistician up there on the dais with the president. Now, another issue I want to address in, is the, in, the, in the sense that you won't believe it, is all this testing that they want to do now, that some of the best experts predict a false positive test result as high as 80%. That means 80 out of 100 people can be told that they have the virus when in fact they don't. How is that possible? Because there's a portion of the COVID-19 virus in the reagents that are used to test your sample. You know, that's like, you, like you, you, you've never smoked marijuana but suddenly you are sing, sing, um, um, singled out with a few other people in the workplace by HR, and they come and they say, well, we want you to pee in this cup. And you're thinking, well, psh, I don't care. I don't take any drugs. And you come back with a positive for marijuana. And you've never eaten a brownie or smoked a joint or anything. And yet it, it, this is what's called a false, po a false positive. Well, how could that be? Well, if there are parts of, of the marijuana molecule in that reagent that they're testing your urine with, it's going to show positive for marijuana. That's the problem with COVID-19 testing. And now the FDA just came out because Abbott Laboratories has this um, test kit that they want to put on the market. And F the FDA came out and said, wait, wait, wait a second. We have a lot of doubts about the product's ability to quickly diagnose a patient. So the FDA issued a public alert uh, saying that it's become aware of, of several scientific studies that raise questions about the, de the device. It's, it's the size of a printer. It's called ID now, the letter I, the letter D, now, ID now. They can take a sample from um, a nasal swab and diagnose a coronavirus infection. Hmm. 
And so the agency said it was particularly concerned about false negative results. See, now here's a here's a here's a curveball. False positives, false negatives, uh, false negatives in which an infected person is, takes a test and then it says they don't have the disease. And as I said, false positives exist as well. How do you establish a false positive or a false negative rate, rate for a particular identified infectious etiology? You know, something that's causing an infection. Well, you take 100 people who have that identifiable, following Koch's postulates, have that, um, that particular pathogen in them that's causing that particular set of symptoms, and you run them through a test that you think will identify that they have this. And out of the 100 that you know have it because it followed Koch's postulates, three of them in the test says that they don't have it. So now you know you have a false negative of three of three percent same same way if you have 100 people that you have drawn serum tissue samples whatever else and 100 and compared it to the 100 that were sick the 100 that aren't sick you purify uh classify down the sample and there is nothing there that could possibly be considered infectious in the sense of the first group that were sick and you run the tests on them and it's three of them, three come back saying, yeah, they're, they're positive for that disease when it's not in the blood whatsoever. Then you have a false positive of 3%. How do you get a false positive 80%? <laughs> because there's reagent, the reagent that they test, the testing material that they use to test your swab has coronavirus in it. And now they got this machine that's supposed to test this stuff in the FDA, quote, we're still evaluating the information about inaccurate results and are in direct communications with Abbott about this important issue. Tim Stenzel, director of the FDA's Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health, said in a statement. Now, I, in a previous podcast, I described how surrogate testing works. But a sur and that's what the, the swabs are about. And if you go... If you want to go somewhere and have yourself tested, you're, you're getting a false test because that false test is based on a non-existent gold standard. You have to have a previous test that is absolutely fail proof, which they have never done with coronavirus. I constantly search Medline and PubMed and they have not absolutely followed Koch's postulates. C-O-K-O-C-H hyphen S postulates. If you need to look it up, you can, Wikipedia will tell you, or you just search Koch's postulates and it'll explain. And so if you don't have a gold standard, there's no way a surrogate test that's based on the gold standard can possibly be accurate. And in the case of COVID-19, a gold standard does not exist. I mean, once again, I'm referring to Koch's postulates. It's in a previous podcast. And if you go back far enough, you will not be able to find evidence for the viral etiology for SARS or H1N1 or H5N1 or Ebola or Zika or even, you might want to sit down before I say this, polio. That's right. Even polio has not been absolutely identified through Koch's postulates to be caused by a virus because there's too many people with polio symptoms uh, during the DDT days. Uh, that did not have a polio virus in them, but they had polio symptoms. And there were people who had polio viruses in them that did not have polio symptoms. So when you have a mishmash like that, it's just a guess. So do I need to go through Koch's postulates? I don't think so. Um, but Or Pasteur's germ theory, which even Pasteur could not prove was true even though so much of modern medical theory is based on it. Just read Pasteur's diaries. It's available. You can get the translations of Pasteur's diaries and how confounded, how confused, how upset, how mad, how angry he got when he could take a identified disease microbe from an animal and put it in the other animal and it wouldn't get sick. That's why we're always fond of saying uh, if the germ theory of disease was true, there'd be nobody alive to believe it. Now, another thing I want to mention, uh, and I don't think I need to go through Koch's postulates. You can look that up if you really want to, but that you have to apply Koch's postulates, and there's problems with Koch's postulates, but 
the, the major problem with Koch's postulates is when they try to ap apply it to a viral disease, they can't prove it. It, it. it falls apart. Now, out of Stanford University comes a statement from epidemiologist John uh, Ioannidis, who blew the whistle on the bad data that's being used to justify the coronavirus crackdowns on our daily life. And he has new research with his colleagues at Standard, uh, Stanford Medical School there in California. And Stan, uh, John uh, uh, Ioannidis is a fellow who blew the whistle on the bad data, as I said. And uh, which is uh, this data, which be, is, is being used to uh, justify the, the crackdowns on our daily life. Uh, his colleagues have gotten together and they've uh, put together this paper. It's not uh, hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but they put this paper together to evaluate the risk of COVID-19 to people under 65 relative to older people and uh, to estimate the uh, absolute risk of death from infection at a certain population level. And then, you know, discern what proportion of deaths occur in the non-elderly without an underlying disease, wherever the epicenters of the pandemic are concerned. Now, let me, I'm quoting from that study. Now, let me put it this way. What is the absolute risk of death from infection at this particular population group? This one, you know, the demographics of the whole thing right there at ground zero of pandemic central. And so <clears throat> as a result the authors have scolded the media for seizing on the stories of these young, healthy people with severe fatal outcomes from the infection. Uh, because there's a few of them, but the media makes it sound like half of the children are dying. And there were a few of them. But the majority of patients dying with this SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 are elderly, and the large majority of the deceased have severe underlying diseases. We know that that's that's pretty well. Everybody knows that by now. And so the, the paper said this, quote, exaggeration should be avoided in responding to this pandemic. Well, tell that to the major media. And so the data they were reviewing came from Louisiana, Michigan, Washington State, New York City, based on those locations um, that had at least 250 deaths as of April 4th. And then they would kind of, you know, stratify it by age to, up to 18 and 18 to 25 and 25 to 45 and up to 65 and past 65 kind of thing. And they also considered the countries that met that same threshold that they were looking at in these cities in the United States, Belgium, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Portugal, Sp uh, Spain, Sweden and Switzerland. And they found widely varying risks depending on where people live such as New York City had 79 deaths per million of under 65 aged people, while Germany's rate was 1.7 deaths per million. New York City, 79. Germany, 1.7. And people at 80 and older were most at risk in Spain, where 1 in 420 died, but again, in Germany, it was the lowest because it was only one in 6,000 that died. But when you start factoring in all the underlying predisposing conditions, then the numbers change dramatically. Because those that were under 65 at the high, uh, um, without these pre-existing conditions were only 0.3% of the deaths in the Netherlands, 07 in Italy, 1.8 in New York. So those who were under the age of 65 who weren't previously sick com from Netherlands compared to New York City, it was six times greater that you could die diagnosed with COVID-19, six times greater in New York City than it was in the country of Netherlands. Hmm. Now, I'm getting to the relevance of this because the researchers concluded that those under 65, which I think the majority of you listening are under 65, quote, have very small risks of COVID-19 death, even in the hotbeds of the pandemic, end quote. 
And deaths, of course, for those with underlying conditions were just remarkably uncommon from one area to another. So the researchers recommended moving away from the one-size-fits-all lockdown policies. Hmm. What do you think about that? So for a, a whole month there, Andrew Cuomo, you know, the governor of New York, they, they gave him about an hour every day on TV, scaring people to death so that people in central Iowa or people in northwestern Arizona or people in eastern Montana could just be literally scared to death out of their pants listening to Cuomo when New York had a much higher density of sick, or pe sick people than anywhere else in the country. Now, it's because they were all crammed together and the other parts of the country were well spread out. There's no science behind that. But people who are crammed together usually have weaker immune systems. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So the researchers were, were, were saying, you got to get away from this one size fits all stuff. This is ridiculous. And what we want to do is protect the high risk elderly individuals. Because if you take if you take all the people who've died from COVID-19, 38% uh, of them are elderly. About 20% of them have pre-existing conditions. And 20% of them have autoimmune problems. That's almost 80% of those who died from COVID-19 were in trouble to begin with. So what does it boil down to? Well, to repeat Dr. Ioannidis, one size does not fit all, and every state in the union should never have been put under the same restrictions as Manhattan. South Dakota never had a shutdown, one of the lowest infection rates. Because they're spread out, that's what most people say. I don't think so, as there's never been a double-blind study establishing any relevance to social distancing. None. Every Tuesday morning when I'm on the national show with Doug Steffen, I go back into PubMed and look, is there anything now about social distancing? No, just models, mathematical models, no double blind studies. And lastly, the thing I have the hardest time believing about this whole thing is the total absence among this illustrious group making up the president's coronavirus task group was someone representing why mankind is still on this planet after so many millennia. I mean, how could it be after so many tens of thousands of years and so many different extinction level events that we've had on this planet? And then just in it, just in the last, you know, few hundred years, who was it that survived the Black Plague? Who survived the typhoid and cholera out, uh, cholera outbreaks? Who survived the Spanish flu when 100 million didn't? I mean, for Pete's sake, where are the nutritionists? Why have so many exposed to the virus never got symptoms? Why don't they talk about that? Well, it's because of their immune systems. And you can't sell drugs to people with healthy immune systems. And what constitutes a strong and resilient immune system to any pathogen? <laughs> well, wouldn't you know it? We just happen to have a podcast on that very subject at ForbiddenDoctor.com. Podcast number 190. Your immune system, the forbidden defense. And why do we say forbidden? Because from the time <clears throat> the first huckster showed up with his bottle of snake oil and a scary story of bugs and snakes and creepy crawly things you couldn't see, but you believed would kill you without that snake oil. We've all been under the power of fear-based ignorance and need to submit to medical authority for relief and healing when all healing is self-healing. The body heals itself. Nobody heals you. The body heals itself, pure and simple. Now, of course, some intervention has to occur when some acute life-threatening crisis occurs, of course. Your heart stops, get to the ER. If you stop breathing, get to the ER. If you cut your arm off, get to the ER. If you have severe debilitating pain, get to the ER. Of course, you wouldn't fool around with that. But when the crisis is over and your vitals stabilize, it's your body that does the healing. And why do some bodies heal faster than others? Well, that's in podcast 190, your immune system, the forbidden defense. So when they leave 
a whole food nutritionist out of the picture and out of the coronavirus task force, you know, I don't I don't have to be to go past the sixth grade to know that they're selling us a bill of goods. and They're not really interested in healing the nation. Just the increased promotion of drugs and the coming mandatory vaccine. And as for me and my family, we will be thinking long and hard before getting that cocktail. And now our state of Utah is beginning to open up from a tyrannical exercise. People are starting to ask questions. I hope they ask a lot of questions. And I hope they find the truth. Now, to conclude this, I just want to bring up the free symptom survey that we offer on the homepage at ForbiddenDoctor.com. Uh, some of you may be hearing this for the first time. It's the most comprehensive survey you're probably ever going to take. Tons of questions. After you're done, you have the opportunity to have a free 30-minute phone consultation, and you'll be given a personalized protocol. This saves you money in the long run because you're not taking supplements you don't need. And all of this at no charge to you. And if you do decide to purchase the recommended supplements, you can get them at a 10% discount if you sign up for our text blast. Now, these text blasts give you fantastic coupons every single week. Just text the word HEALTHY to 41411. We'll text you back a coupon code, which you can use on our website, ForbiddenDoctor.com, when you check out. And because it's open to anybody now, you don't, there's no portal they have to go crawling through to get the standard process. Uh, you'll find discount a uh, discount there that is the cheapest prices anywhere on the Internet as far as standard process is concerned. Or you can just call the call office and take advantage of it that way at 801-523-1890. 801-523-1890. They can help you sign up for the text blast. And remember, it's your patronage of our offers that keeps this podcast on the air. Now, the statements made in this podcast about specific products have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided or any information contained on or in any product label or packaging or this podcast is for informational purposes only, and it's not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other health care professionals. So... Thank you for listening to this Forbidden Information and our Forbidden Podcast. Mary will be back soon. So join us next time for another in-depth discussion of forbidden knowledge, and we will see you then.